Here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the spotted lanternfly is everywhere, making itself a huge public nuisance. But what effect, if any, is spotted lanternfly actually having? My name is Braley Burke. I am the Integrated Pest Management Specialist at Phipps, also an entomologist, so I know a lot about insects. I keep all the plants here healthy. That's my main part of the job, though lately, I've been the spotted lanternfly expert too. <laughs> so when it was first introduced, we weren't really sure how it was going to affect the plants here. They feed on a very large host range, over a hundred species of plants. So it was kind of how many plants are going to be effective and, or affected and possibly die from this insect. Why it was worrisome was just because we had never had it in this environment before. And they do tend to swarm when they feed. They all like to go together, feed with their straw-like mouth parts, they suck the fluids out of the plant, and then they excrete the extra fluids onto the plants themselves, causing them to look sticky. Then mold can move in and it kind of makes the plant look gross. At this point, it's been here for a decade now, and we're seeing that really the big issue are the it's the grapevine industry. They're hurting the grapes. For us, we have so much plant diversity that even if it did kill one or two plants, it wouldn't be a big issue. So yeah, we're fine. It, other than the guests not liking the spotted lanternflies being around. The potential harm of the spotted lanternfly on the grapevine industry is a major concern. Trying to determine the impact of the spotted lanternfly and how it could be controlled are researchers Laura Nixon and Tracy Lusky with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Because the insect is feeding from the phloem of the plant, being actually able to quantify how it's harming the plant is quite difficult. Because it's not like when something injures like the fruit of a plant, you can see if a fruit is injured. Um, but with SLF, you start to see some wilting if there's a high population on, but then depending on the plant species, they may recover once the SLF has moved on. Um, or the SLF may stay until the plant has died. And just really being able to see the impact is a little more complicated with this species. It, because they feed on the phloem, um, you know, as sap sucking insects, that process takes longer just to define what the impacts are. You know, there have been observations of potential yield loss in Pennsylvania on grapevines that have been heavily fed on, but trying to get at that relationship is is still that's still as Laura indicated that's still an active area of study. Unfortunately, when you have an invasive species, it's all, you know it's like throwing all the balls up in the air and you have to kind of figure it out and 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 you're starting from scratch and trying to understand. So it takes a while. There are some potential biological controls out there that are specific for spotted lanternfly, hopefully specific for spotted lanternfly. Um, but these are also from Asia, so they're not native to here. They're not present here. Um, so in order to be able to be sure that these are going to be effective, but also not going to affect any of our native species or important species here, you have to do a lot of research in quarantine with these insects. And there are generalist predators that are feeding on lanternflies. You see things like praying mantids and yellow jackets and other predaceous insects beginning to feed on lanternfly, and that's often what happens is that as they remain in the environment, some of our native predators can start to recognize them as a good meal. We don't want to cause problems for a native species here. And so that's why the time is taken to ensure that it is a good species. But in the interim, what we try to do um, is to develop strategies that we can use to reduce the spread through monitoring tools, through people, citizen scientists using those trap out strategies, or using some of the insecticide tools that have been used to limit the spread through, you know, some of the work that USDA APHIS has done um, on particular host trees, things like that. So. You kind of have to try to reduce the spread, learn as much as you can about the biology, and then hopefully that biocontrol agent is able to be released. And so it's sort of like you have short-term and long-term goals when you have an invasive species, um, you know, trying to put out the initial fire, but ultimately trying to come up with a long-term solution so that, you know, you don't really notice them anymore. That's the goal. You know, you wouldn't really notice much anymore. You may not eradicate them completely, but they won't be a problem.